Welcome back to the Not Quite Pod. Today we've got Pippa with us. Pippa, do you just quickly want to introduce yourself and let everyone know a bit about yourself? My name is Pippa Stacey. I'm a writer, a speaker and a communication consultant. So I do a bit of everything. I'm based up north in not so sunny Yorkshire and I have a chronic illness called ME. And if you haven't heard of it before, ME is an energy limiting condition. Um, I've lived with it for quite a long time now. I first acquired the symptoms in my teens, um, but like many people had a good old dollop of medical gaslighting, which meant I didn't get my diagnosis until quite a few years later. But from there, a lot of my sort of story, so to speak, has been learning to not only cope with living with a disabling chronic illness, but also learning how to live with it. And it was kind of that that prompted me to turn to the online community. I saw other people sharing their stories. I thought, oh yeah, I'd like to get in on that. And everything kind of grew from there. And that's a very whistle-stop tour of how I ended up here. (laughs) Just, I wanted to dive into a little bit more. Like I always like to get the context of how people grew up, their journey when they were growing up, just sort of, because I find that it often shapes where people tend to gravitate towards. So what was growing up like for you? Well, prior to the age of 14, I was living a very different life to the one I live now. I was actually in training, in intensive ballet training. I was going down a pre-professional route. So I had gotten into a ballet school and I was very much on the track to hopefully developing a career in dance. So I was doing crazy long days. very intense training at a very young age. I used to leave school in the afternoon early and then drive to Leeds about an hour away. I used to eat my dinner and get changed in the car into a leotard and try and do my homework, dance all night, come home, go to bed and then do it all over again. So it was definitely a lot. And um, I think part of the reason it took me quite a while to figure out what was going on with me and figure out that I actually was living with this condition was because when you're brought up like that, you're very much trained to be of a specific mindset. And that is that no matter how much pain or discomfort you're feeling, you have to push through. You have to ignore it. If you want to be successful, that's what you have to do. Um, So when I did start feeling a little bit, I say a little bit, when I did start feeling unwell with my symptoms, even though they were mild to start with, I was very much of the mindset like, oh, I've just got to push through, strong people push through. Um, So yeah, that very early on was very different to how it was from that point onwards. (laughs) Wow, I did not know that. And I've known you for quite some time. I did not know that you started in dance. <laughs> there you go. You learn something new every day. It Honestly, it feels like a whole like separate life time ago. So it's I always forget that people don't know it, but it's like a, almost like I lived a completely different life. So that's yeah. my fun fact for you. <laughs> there you go. I mean, so I'm guessing it was a case of the symptoms got slightly worse and then you decided to start looking into how to best go about or looking for a diagnosis and looking for answers obviously at that point you wouldn't have known what it was but yeah Yeah. what was that journey like uh wouldn't recommend it (laughs) it was um yeah so like like you said the symptoms were quite mild to start with so I'm pretty much carrying on with life as much as usual and pushing through as much as I can which I know now was a terrible thing to be doing but back then Mm. I didn't know any better And I started going to my GP, but I found that I didn't really have the language to explain what I was experiencing. So I was saying, I feel really tired and run down all the time because I didn't know how to describe this like really strong feeling of malaise and weakness and fatigue. Like when you're a teenager and you're in a doctor's office with an authority figure who clearly thinks that you're making it up, like you just don't really have the language or the confidence to express yourself in that way. So they would kind of like, They did routine blood tests and they all came back normal and that was that. So at that time, they attributed it to things like teenage hormones, like maybe stress over GCSEs. And I was like, oh no. But that carried on for three years and it was progressively getting worse. My symptoms were getting more and more difficult to live with. But because I'm me, I was just trying to ignore it, trying to carry on. And then another thing you might not know about me is I used to do a lot of work with kids and... I was actually, um, it was the summer between my first and my second year of university. And I was in Greece working on a kid's holiday camp. Wow. Um, and that was the point when my body broke. That that point, <laughs> that specific scenario was when my body went, you know what? No, I'm done. I've had enough. <laughs> this is when we're going to have a meltdown. <laughs> so would not recommend. But no. um, I was 
like I was 19 at that point and as horrible as it was uh, that was the thing that finally prompted the GP to take it seriously and I finally got the referral to a specialist service for ME and that's when I finally got that diagnosis. Wow, I, 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 just the idea of being in a foreign country and then your body having that kind of meltdown, shutdown. Yeah, no, mm, not, not for me. I think the only place I would feel safe is anywhere like medically advanced, but then also it's the whole thing of accessing that while abroad. Oh, no, no, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, so for those who don't know, what is ME? It is, uh, I'm trying to think, it's a difficult condition to describe. And in the past, the media has done it quite an injustice. So the way I typically describe it is it's a neurological condition, but it affects multiple different systems in your body. There's not a great deal of research as to what causes it, but it typically comes about after somebody has either had quite a severe post-viral illness that they haven't recovered from properly, or they've gone through an extreme trauma, like a car accident or some, some sort of physical distress. Um, mm -hmm. And the main symptoms are this unrelenting fatigue. And no matter how much you rest, that fatigue doesn't really go away. There's things like chronic pain, sensory overload. You can be very sensitive to noise and light. And then the key thing that differentiates ME from a lot of other chronic illnesses that share similar symptoms is something called post-exertional malaise. And that's basically where, let's say you've got a everybody's got a baseline level of energy per day and it's different for everybody. But with people with ME, if they do any activity, whether that's physical or mental, anything at all that takes them over that baseline level of mm -hmm. energy that they have, they will then suffer and pay the repercussions of that. Not necessarily immediately after, but it will be 24 hours after or 48 hours yeah. after. And that's when your symptoms just really manifest and they're so much worse. And it's, a really horrible experience would not recommend. So that's why there's not a great deal of stuff you can do to help yourself and there's no targeted treatment. But one of the key things is learning how to pace yourself and figure out how to work with the energy envelope you have at that time. Yeah, because I was going to say, because I know from speaking to you that you have to plan so much of you do, what you do based on trying to maintain, like sustain a certain energy level, because if you over over commit yourself to stuff it just becomes too much yeah for sure and for a long time I was kind of like oh it can't be that bad I'm just going to do the thing anyway and suffer the repercussions but mm. you quickly learn you can't live your life booming and busting in that way if you want to have any hope of experiencing improvement so it's often the case that you have to make quite difficult decisions and sacrifices but ultimately in my experience anyway, and I've had a great deal of luck and privilege on my side as well, because I have experienced a lot of improvement. But yeah, just getting out of that boom and bust mindset is one of the biggest barriers to overcome in my experience. I think as well, I'd imagine it's being a young person as well, you want to keep up with your peers, you want to be doing all the stuff they're doing, but you've got the extra consideration. Now, obviously, from my perspective, I've got the additional access needs and to a point, my energy levels but not to the point you've got so i can imagine being a young person in that scenario it's like oh shit like how how do i maintain good relationships with my peers but also learn how to say no i'm not gonna have enough energy to do all of these things you guys are thinking of doing that's exactly it yeah and I was still at uni when i was going through the thick of it so living in a student house on the one hand it was it was a positive thing and I still made the best of it because the great thing about living with your friends is that you don't have to use energy leaving the house to spend time with them. So that was really yeah. good and really positive. But then you're also surrounded by this student culture where, where people are constantly going out and doing the things. And honestly, the FOMO I had for the remaining two years of that degree, oh, I, I, I found the FOMO more painful than the physical symptoms sometimes. It was yeah. absolutely brutal. But... I suppose you learn to prioritise the things that matter to you rather than what society expects of you. Yeah. I say that like I've finessed that process. It's something I'm still very much working on to this day. <laughs> but when you have limited energy, you do become much more intentional in how you use it. And I imagine that's something I imagine that's something that's true for you as well. Even though our access yeah. needs are slightly different, you do learn to figure out the stuff that matters most to you. 
Definitely, and like it's it's also realizing how your body reacts to different conditions. So, like part of mine is <laughs> being ginger, and not to be fair, actually, CP plays part in this as well. Me and Heat don't go together, but particularly cerebral palsy wise, me and Cold, we are not friends. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's the other <laughs> balance to me. I also have this weird thing. Not to turn this into a weird me moment, but I also have this weird thing that I've only recently got over where I don't like, I didn't like wearing layers because it made me feel claustrophobic. So that combined with being susceptible to the cold and being like, no, I'm not going to wear my thermals. It didn't, didn't end well. How do you get around that? How do you get around it when the thing that's going to help you is the thing that also causes annoyance? <laughs> I, I just suffered. That's really. I just went. No, I'd rather be not claustrophobic and deal with cramps rather than be claustrophobic. <laughs> You have to pick the lesser of two evils, which actually I can relate to. When you've played like Access Needs Bingo, sometimes you have to pick the least bad one. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, y- yeah, not to s- a single out a single brand, but Uniqlo's been a massive helper of that because their thermals Ooh. are really comfy. So, <gasps> yeah. Noted, noted. So I like go. the M&S ones. I like M&S and I like heat holders, yeah. but Uniqlo, yeah. okay, that's good to know. Uniqlo have got really nice ones and they look really smart. So like if you want to wear them as an outer piece of clothing, like I've actually got the like their Arctic version that are meant to be for temperatures between like minus 10 and minus 20. And they are, they're really good, but they also look really nice as well. They're actually what, um, cause I know Pippa recently messaged me about going to Prague. They're actually what I was wearing all the time in Prague. So there you oh, go. okay. That's really handy to know. Actually, I was stalking all of your like posts about Prague. I was like, <laughs> I need to find all the experience, all the research I can get. I, I think we've abandoned Prague though. We're looking at, um, oh my gosh, where are we looking at? Um, begins with V it's in Italy. Venice? V- v- Verona. 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 That is, nice. that is silly, isn't it? I've not just made myself look really silly. I think that is, Verona uh, my silly. geography is not great. I think that's, that's right. I think it sounds right. <laughs> We'll go with that. Hopefully I haven't made myself look really silly. It's the place from Romeo and Juliet. I do know that much. Nice, nice. We're um we're looking at Lisbon, I think is our next one. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah, we're going with uh my business partner and his wife and me and Gina. So that'd be good. Although we've got a very weird tangent. Anyway, coming back to uh coming back to a bit more about you. One thing I did want to ask you that I didn't actually know is do you do you drink and what if you do what is the impact of that because i can imagine through uh, yeah just a sort of a thought process that has a massive impact if you start caning the alcohol plus yeah fatigue not gonna do it <laughs> mm-hmm. and this is a funny one because it's so different for people with me and other chronic illnesses and a lot of people with me do stay away from alcohol because they think it's not worth the aggro which as i get older i I'm definitely leaning more towards that Mm -hmm. but I do drink socially not as often as I used to because like you say there are repercussions it can make your symptoms worse but the one um again this is so different for everyone but the thing that affects me with alcohol is um I have quite a few sleep issues like insomnia pain insomnia and if I have alcohol it really impacts my ability to fall asleep and get good quality sleep um yeah, and me, yeah, yeah I'm not a nice person when I've not had enough sleep so it definitely factors in and I definitely don't drink as much as I used to but I do enjoy a drink socially but definitely not to excess definitely my student yeah. days are long behind me <laughs> <laughs> what is pain insomnia I don't think I've ever heard of it before oh it's a really fun thing Charlie you're gonna love this it's um <laughs> it's basically insomnia where you can't sleep but as well as like the physiological thing of not being able to sleep it might be that your experience of pain is keeping you awake so if your pain is too debilitating that can impact your ability to fall and stay asleep as well so not a good time would not Not recommend (laughs) no i mean i struggle with sleep enough as it is i can't put it down to a certain thing i'm just weird because i'm not i'm not a night owl and i'm not a morning person so Are you I'm a uh, pigeon. <laughs> yes, yes, basically that is just just me. I am a perfectly exhausted pigeon. I literally ask Gina any time in the morning. Don't talk to me until I've finished at least my first coffee, unless you only want yes, yes or no answers. <laughs> I completely agree, hundred <laughs> percent. 
<laughs> Gina knows when we're sat in the kitchen, where but like literally, if it's an if it's a question that I can answer with a grunt, then it's fine. If it's anything more extensive, like if she's asking me about our freelance stuff, I'm like, no, yeah, no, not yet, not, not yet, yet. <laughs> not yet. It's funny because like I. I'm generally more of a morning person than an evening person, but I'm exactly the same as you in that when I first get up, I need a bit of time to like recalibrate and like yep. boot up for the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask you from what you mentioned earlier, obviously from your dance career. So it sounds like you've got very much caught up well from the way that dance, the dance industry often treats young youngsters. It's very much push, push like you say, push, push, push. What is your opinion on hustle culture as you are now, obviously you're now a freelancer, you work full time uh, as full time self-employed. So what's your view when it comes to hustle culture and that whole keep going, keep going, keep going, don't stop. Because if you stop, then you're going to be behind everyone else. What's oh, your view on that? It's such a hard topic. It's, it's so prevalent that even if you try with all your might to ignore it, you can't fully get away from it. So I very yep. much tried to build my career and my way of life because I've my whole working life, I've had my chronic illness. So I've tried to build a career quite mindfully around that. But like you say, yep. when you're freelance, there's only so much you can control in your working day. There's always stuff coming up at the last minute. There's always new things to explore. And there's never really a point where you're done with work because there's always something else that you can be doing. And yep. I think as well, social media just makes it so much worse because even when you do give yourself the grace to have that time and you think it's okay to stop and to slow down you're constantly surrounded by people who s appear to still be doing all of the things and you think oh my gosh why aren't I doing that I'm clearly behind yeah. I'm the worst person in the history of ever um yeah. so it's tricky and I imagine it's a similar thing for you too and I'd be lying if I said I'd managed to get out of it because I am very much still caught up in it but what I'm trying to champion now is still having, if this is what a person chooses and if this is what they value, I want to champion the idea of people pursuing their goals and their dreams and building a career they love, but doing it in a way that's genuinely accessible for them. And if that means moving at a slower pace and taking more breaks and having the ability yeah. to step back, I try and remind other people as well as myself that Again, this is not the ideal way to look at it because there's a hint of capitalism behind this, but sometimes <laughs> here having <we> breaks... <laughs> here we go. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Sometimes having breaks is the way yeah. to keep going. If you keep pushing yourself and going and going and going, you're going to struggle over the longer term and you're eventually going to crash and then you're going to have to step away completely. So when you're yeah. thinking about that as the alternative, stepping back temporarily doesn't seem so bad of a thing. Consistency but, is better than, yeah, consistency is better than 100 mile an hour for six months of the year and then dead for the rest. That is it, yeah, yeah. Not ideal. Nobody wants that. It's really tricky as well to try and, like, because what I always say, and, I, and admittedly I'm still battling with this to this day, is with breaks, also schedule them in. Like, make it part of your plan that you're going to have a set break time. Now, I'm not saying that they're the only times you can take breaks. Like there's certainly been times where I've been working and gone, no, nah, my head's not in it. Um, it's not worth me sitting here for two hours when I, well, I could get the same level of work done on a good day in 20 minutes. But also allowing yourself that time to recharge, particularly like I always relate to that because another thing I have being into entrepreneurship and being into doing all of my freelance stuff but then also being a gamer, not even a gamer because I'm not a heavy duty gamer, but enjoying playing on consoles, the amount of like mental abuse you give yourself with that because you're like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this because I should be doing this. It's like, it's horrible. It is, it is. But then it's allowing yourself time to do the things that you enjoy. And it's it's, it's a catch-22 because everyone goes, oh, but you enjoy your business. And I'm like, yeah, but the brain power required for my business compared to the brain power playing PlayStation, completely different. And you know, different. like, I bet this is the same for you as well as me. I think there's a whole other angle when you genuinely enjoy your job. Like yeah. when you're not, when you're not enjoying the work you do, it's much easier to take a break because you don't want to be doing anything else. But when you do something that you genuinely enjoy and that makes you happy and fills you with purpose, it is so hard to step away and it's so hard yeah. to stop. Like for me, it's 
writing is the one thing that I find more difficult to pace than anything in the world because taking yourself away from it when you're in the zone is brutal and oh it's the worst <laughs> and I imagine as well as a writer there's almost that fear of like wanting to do the idea while you've got the idea while you can <laughs> mind the pun write it down um it, it's it's like that whole thing of like once you get into the flight like if you've fully mapped out an idea in your head and then you go oh I'll do it next week next week comes and you'll go what was the idea again that's it yeah it's gone you just have to like you have to find ways around it so like something i do i don't know if this is interesting or not but i like if i know i'm going to need to stop i will just jot down really roughly whatever my thought process was and wherever i was going to go next or if i'm not well enough to write and i've got an idea i'll like speak it as a voice note into my phone yeah um it's yeah but like you've probably seen as well there's all this stuff about like how to be the best writer online. And it's all these people saying, yep, you need at least two hours to warm up and just do some fl- free flow. <laughs> you're going to do three hours of deep focus. And then I'm just sat here yeah. like on a good day, I can do two hours max and that's it. Yeah. So that's not going to work yeah. for me. So you don't need to do it, that. It, it, it's playing into that social media culture though of like, everyone's got low so i'm like the other thing as well is i'm not at the point you are or not on the journey you are of being fully self-employed already so then i do have the added fun of balancing freelance stuff with a nine to five job and now everyone goes oh that's such a privileged position to be in. well yes it is it also pr- it brings its own set of challenges <laughs> for sure I, trying to balance calls meetings brain power sleep Going and also as a gym head as well, going to the gym, all of those is like it's it's it's, it's intense. Like if you looked it's at like, my Tina's diary, it's got so many colours, so many bookings. It's, it's crazy. That does not surprise me, honestly. Having worked with you and Gina a little bit in the past, that does not surprise me. And it's like <laughs> the cognitive load of that as well, isn't it? Yeah. Like it's having all of these plates spinning all the time, and like yeah. even if you finesse things to a point where they're physically accessible, just the cognitive load of having all these different things happening at mm. once, that in itself can bring a whole load of challenges. To give you a real world example, literally last week, Gina, Gina, I was literally in the bathroom brushing my teeth at half five in the morning and all Gina heard was me go, oh shit, I double booked someone's meeting and I was like, oh no, it's just clicked what times I've got both of those booked in for. <laughs> Oh no, and it just hit you. (laughs) Yeah, horrible, absolutely horrible. And just because you mentioned it, I have to ask, what is your view on capitalism and more so like from the viewpoint of like a disabled person? Because I have a very conflicting view because I understand that there's some issues with capitalism, but then also I'm very aware that capitalism is the game that the game that is in play, so we have to play it whether we like it or not because we're not going to be able to change it. So that's my view of like, look, this isn't going anywhere, so I've got to figure out how it works to, to, yeah. to gamify it for my own gain, which sounds really, like, I can't think of a nice way to phrase it. But, yeah, so, like, it's particularly as a disabled person as well because there's an added element of, like, we have limited opportunities when it comes to career and stuff like that. So then there almost feels like an added pressure for a lot of several people to become entrepreneurial, freelance, self-employed or whatever it might be, because they're in their own control, if that makes sense. Yeah, I have quite similar views to you, but I'm also like, I think I'm heavily influenced by the fact that a lot of the work I do is centered around matching chronically ill people with inclusive work opportunities. And obviously it goes without saying that not every chronically ill person and not every disabled person is either capable of work or wants to be in work but we also know that for the people who do want that it can be a completely life-changing thing but -hmm. then it's also sometimes feels like people sometimes are only interested in acquiring disabled and chronically ill talent if it's for some sort of like financial or or material gain sometimes that's the feels like that's the only way to get people to care about it when really there are just so many more morally important reasons than that and then the yeah. other yeah. like thing I'm on a bit of a journey with at the minute is I this will come as no surprise to anybody who knows me, but I 
like I am very driven by accomplishments and achievements and I place a lot of my self-worth and value as a person on my ability to achieve. So I think all of that plays into I wonder into where some... that comes from. Oh, I was a real head scratcher. <laughs> <laughs> so trying to untangle that at the minute as well. And I think in the past, I've been very sort of like on my pedestal saying, oh, yeah, work is great. It's amazing. Everybody should do it. But I think I have a lot of internalized ableism in that area as well. Yeah. But like you say, it's complex. It's really complex. And I think some people will have radically different views to me. And I also think that's OK, because I think there's a lot I need to learn from other people's experiences yeah. as well. I think it's even harder, like, from my perspective, well, obviously there's the added thing of like having the chip on my shoulder, having the issues getting into employment that I faced when I was younger. And then it's another element of both my parents are self-employed, both my parents self-employed, both run their own businesses. So I've grown up in a, not even entrepreneurial, because I wouldn't class, although my parents are, I wouldn't class them as what like we now know as entrepreneurial. They just kind of saw an opportunity and went, we'll do that then. And that's how it kind of worked. And obviously seeing them have the freedom that they had from being self-employed, obviously it comes with its own set of stresses and challenges. It was kind of like, I want to do that. I rather that like that. I think that's a lot of where mine comes from. And I think it is so interesting to think like all the different layers that play a part in, like I said, the way your brain interprets what success is, if that makes sense. It's 100%. so weird. It is. It's bizarre. And like, I can't imagine what my perception be if it would be of that if I wasn't a disabled person. I don't know if it's mm. the same for you. Like, I yeah, can't. 100%. It's so, it's just so weird. And it's so individual I, for all of us, isn't it? I always give the example of if I was able bodied, I would have probably tried to become a footballer, failed miserably, and ended up as an accountant. <laughs> that would have probably been my journey. <laughs> That's a very niche. I mean, look at me. I could have tried to be a ballet dancer. I could have easily failed and ended up being a... Quick, Charlie, what's an example of a job? Of an average job. Um, a marketeer. Yeah, working in John Lewis. Oh, no, John Lewis is a bad example. I hope I wouldn't have been working in John Lewis. You just don't know, do you? You just don't know. There's no it's, way. Like, it's like that whole thing of people always ask me, like, would you hand your disability back? And they always get really weird when I go no and i'm like they're like why and i'm like well it's better the devil you know and also i i all the th weird and wonderful good stuff that i've been able to do because i just so happen to be that ginger guy in a wheelchair <laughs> it's, it's the, like oh yeah it's that whole thing of like it's a, i find it do you know what else i find really weird you know this thing going around like I agree with the idea behind it, but like the idea that your disability doesn't define you. But then the other thing I can't caveat that with is I'm like, but it's such a big part of me. Like my entire brand is built around the fact that I'm in a wheelchair or have a different ability to someone else. So then it's hard mm -hmm. to then say your identity isn't tied to your disability because it, in my context, it kind of is. And it's very strange. I completely agree with that. I don't know if you know this, actually. I've just written a book. and I the very... was going to come on to it. <laughs> I'm sorry I jumped the gun, but the no, very no, first... It's all good. We'll, we'll jump in. Um, literally. Out your book. Oh, my gosh. It just reminded me because literally the first chapter is about rediscovering your identity and how to balance the fact that disability does take such a toll on your identity. And it's completely up to individuals whether they want it to be a part of their identity or not. But I wanted to put it out there that it's totally OK if it does define you and it is part of your identity, because that is I feel a similar way to you on that. Um, but yeah, wrote a book. It's yeah. called it's called how to do life with a chronic illness and it's coming out on the 18th of april and it's essentially the book i wish my younger self had had it's about how well a lot of the stuff that's out there already about chronic illness and there isn't a great deal of it to start with let's be honest but a lot of it is very focused on the medical side um which is obviously mm -hmm. really important but it's about things like symptoms and management and all of that stuff and there needs to be more of that definitely but I felt like there was this really big gap for the rest of life. Um, so yeah. you've got this chronic illness. Nobody teaches you about things like how to adapt your hobbies, how to manage your relationships, how to socialize, how to 
figure out who you are and what kind of goals you want to set for yourself. And I set quite an ambitious target of trying to approach chronic illness through a more social model of disability, which is something that I'm trying to do through a lot of my work and it's proving quite the challenge, but yeah, I really hope people enjoy it and I really hope it's helpful. I just wanted to share like practical t like tips and like stuff from other contributors and just some like words of reassurance just to kind of hopefully help people reach those points in a less painful way than I did. <laughs> 100%. I did want to ask as well, coming on to like the actual process of writing the book. I, I mean, I am like an overexcited two-year-old and would never have the patience to sit down and write a book. I've played with the idea several times because I think I think I'd l I love the idea of being able to like obviously publish something that helps people, but also the whole thing of like I'm an author. And that sounds really like really what's the word? Really self centered and really arrogant to say. I'm like I just want the title of being author, but I just think particularly I think being dyslexic is almost that like fuck you to the middle, be yeah. able to write yeah it, but what was the process of writing like how how long were you writing for how did you structure the writing okay so the thing you should know about me is this is something i've always wanted to do so i've always had like a million book ideas in the back of my head so deciding mm. what the book was going to be and the content wasn't the hard bit for me so when this opportunity came to me and I was very, very lucky and I'll be transparent about that, but I will also caveat that by saying I've had a lot of rejections before now. I've been rejected by publishers so many times like anybody else, but when this particular publisher came to me with this opportunity, I knew exactly what I wanted to write. And the way things worked out, there's a, there's a whole other story about this, but it's, it's probably too much to get into, but I wrote the book from start to finish in four months while still working what my other job. What the fuck? How? Yeah, yeah I don't know. <laughs> it was, but I think, honestly, all of the stuff that I'd shared has been sitting on the top of my brain for so long that when I started writing, the difficult bit for me is always getting the structure right. And I always have to spend a lot of time thinking about the structure. But when it comes to actually writing it, it just all came out. And it was like, obviously wow. it's taxing in the sort of yeah. energy level, but... Yeah, so that's my probably one of my biggest accomplishments today. It wow. wrote a book in <laughs> I mean, that's really I expected you to say like a year and a half. That, that yeah. was like <laughs> where I was guessing. But that's, I mean, as I say, when it's a topic that you know a lot about and it's obviously using your lived experience, it then becomes very natural, natural to you. And I'd imagine it was, like you say, it's almost like opening the floodgates as soon as you started yeah. writing. Um, sure. But yeah, what is the journey like? Like, I mean, I've never even thought about it. The journey of like applying to publishers and saying, right, I've got this idea. What do you guys think? Do you think it would work? How does, what, what, what does that look like? It's very different depending on what you're writing and what you want the finished product to be. Um, but it's essentially the case. So most of my, my experience is in non, well, all of my experience is in nonfiction. I've, this isn't my first book, but this is my first time in what's known as traditional publishing, which is where you work with one of the big publishers as opposed to working with one of the smaller ones or self publishing. Yeah. So it's usually the case that you either approach agents or publishers with um, a submission. And that's kind of like almost like an elevator pitch of your idea, like what you want to yeah. write about, what it will look like and why they should publish it and why you should be the one to write it. Um, so that's usually what happens. But the thing that was different this time is that the publisher came to me and I still did that submission and it still went to the board and it still had to be approved and all of that. But I did have that's that slight insane. leg up that like, yeah. oh, and then... I managed because I had the book offer I managed to get an agent which is another big hurdle so it it all kind of fell wow. into place and it's all been like it's been this has been going on since 2022 so even though I wrote the book in four months this whole process started I think July 2022 and the book will come oh. out April 2024 so the production part is much right. longer than the writing part <laughs> that's mad I mean I know for a fact like I've been trying to book Pippa for this episode four months so now i understand why so honestly thank you charlie you've been so patient i've had to rearrange this like at least three times that's fine honestly like and let's say it was kind of when i saw the book come out i was like oh it all makes sense now okay yeah that's fine <laughs> I know, and it was so painful because I couldn't tell you. And I was like, oh, I could hint. I was like, no, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I've the kept it as well, 
<laughs> was when you took because me and Pippa work also on another project together. And when she took a step back, I was like, Pippa, okay, and now, <laughs> and now it all makes sense. Oh, to be fair, there were a few other reasons for that as well, but that was that was a big one of them. Yeah, but yeah, it was so hard, wow. especially when we were talking more last year as well because we were working together. It's been yeah, so yeah. hard keeping this with the, from the people who. I talk to quite a lot. So it, yeah. I'm just so relieved that it's out in the world now and I can talk about it. It still so, doesn't feel real, to be honest. So excited. So do you think, I know it's not happened yet and it's, you still want it to come out, but do you think now that you, you do want to release more and you've, um, uh, well, you've already said you've got loads of other ideas and I think, would you want to go more into maybe doing fiction? I'm not so sure about fiction. I'm not sure that I'm good enough for fiction to be totally transparent with you, or at least not at this moment in time. I would love to do more nonfiction if the opportunity comes up. I've got a real yeah. interest in narrative nonfiction. So I'm hoping we'll, we'll just have to see, because even if you have one book and it's successful, there's never any guarantee that there'll be another one. And it's brutal and disabled voices in particular. It's so hard to get them out there and it's so hard to, prove that it's not just this really niche tiny audience and that there's yeah. bigger market value as well so there's a lot of struggles but i really really hope there's going to be the opportunity to do more stuff like this in the future yeah definitely the power of the purple pound yes <laughs> <Capital. laughs> <laughs> um, we've, we've done a bit of a weird route but one thing i wanted to come back to is obviously your journey uh, correct me if i'm wrong your journey within creating started with blogging now, where did that all come from? Oh, it was, I'll take you back. It was 2014. I had just, I was just about to be diagnosed with my illness. I just, I was at the point where I was really unwell and I couldn't find anybody who I could relate to in the world around me. I couldn't find any information at all. I had no prior knowledge of disability. And almost by accident, I stumbled upon this online chronic illness community on uh, back then it was on Twitter and it's mostly on Instagram now, but just by chance, I found this whole community of people that I could relate to. And honestly, I can't tell you what an impact that had on me, just seeing other people sharing their experiences and normalizing it. And I always say, I think I learned more about my condition from two hours on social media than I had in the two years prior to that. So it was seeing other people sharing their experiences and doing it so beautifully that kind of made me think, I want to get on getting on this as well. I want to be doing this. Um, and I'd always been a writer, so that bit wasn't like the hard part. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I started off on Instagram, started just documenting my experiences and how I was feeling. And it was very sort of medical model back then because that reflected yeah. what I was going through at the time. Um, but then a couple of years later, that turned into my blog, which I still run to this day. Um, and yes, yeah, so over time, my audience has grown. I've learned so much about disability and I'm just so grateful, like having that platform on social media and my blog, like, well, you know, it, it can open up so many opportunities mm -hmm. and yeah. it's really led me to the line of work I'm in now and the person who I am as well. And I'll never not be grateful for that. It's one of the best things that has ever happened to me. No, I understand. I, I feel the exact same, like some of the opportunities, like, the fact that my thing started as wanting to be a fitness YouTuber to where I am now is quite wild. Um, <laughs> it's, but then, like I say, it's like all the cool people you meet, all the weird and wonderful opportunities you get given and all the like things you learn just by interacting with the community. It's yeah, it is crazy. But the other thing as well is I've got a lot of respect for yourself and anyone that does blogging. Because I blogging was just something I tried and could never, I could never crack. Like it never felt natural to me. It never really worked. And like the only, to be honest, the biggest thing that's felt natural, weirdly, is this. This is what's yeah. felt most natural to me because I'm a chatterbox, love talking to people, love finding out stuff. Written just, um, I suppose it comes from maybe the dyslexia. It was like my brain just didn't like it. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a hard space to get into. But I love watching yourself and others where they they've got to through their blogs. It's it's insane. It's almost like completely different sets of skills for different platforms, isn't it? Like yeah, the 
the blogging is completely, even though I write for Instagram and I write for my blog, like it feels like two very separate skills because the way you present the information on different platforms feels completely different and you're talking to a different audience. And I imagine it's the same with you for your podcast. Yeah. And like, yeah. it's clear, like you are good at this. Like <laughs> I've been podcast before, you are good at this. You, you ask good questions, you're easy to talk to and it's clear you have like a knack for this. It's just... Like, whereas I, for example, I do the speaking work and I love being on other people's podcasts, but I don't think I would be a natural host like you are. It's just all these different skill sets for different platforms. It's just having the ability to explore that as well. It's just, it's a lot of fun trying things out, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you never know to try it. And also thank you massively because a lot of the time I sit here and go, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's, it's cra- honestly, but like the different skill sets you have to have for the different platforms and like the different things that people bring, like some content I watch creators create, I'm like, I would never have been able to create that. And then someone, it, like, it just comes naturally to them. And it's, it is so interesting how different people's brains interpret stuff. It's, it's really strange sometimes. So the other thing you mentioned about your speaking and consultancy when did that come into play and, and how did that intertwine with what you're doing now and what you were doing back then as well? How did that all come about? The speaking is such a weird one. I, if you could have told my younger self that I would be a speaker as part of my job, they would have been having none of it. But it definitely happened quite accidentally. I was I always say I was I was lovingly pushed into speaking. I worked with a few people And sometimes opportunities came up where they needed somebody to be speaking or presenting or being the one on video. And Mm. once I started doing it a few times, um, one of the charities I used to work with had a video producer and she was the one who kind of went to the CEO and said she needs to be doing more stuff like this. So she was a big part of how it all started. Um, So I started taking on speaking opportunities when they came in, mostly for free at the start. Um, But from there, like the the caliber of opportunities and stuff has continued to increase and it's definitely a learning curve like i definitely i'm always trying to upskill and i'm always trying to get better and more confident but even in the last few years the difference between i did i did a tedx talk in 2019 and it it was an incredible opportunity but i can't watch it back because i just i watch it and i think oh my gosh i could do such a better job of it now and yeah. it's i know that's not a good way to think but it's no, quite it's it, evolving, it's also, yeah. You recognize the progress that you've made. And like, that's why, like, Jesus, I mean, I've not done many major speaking opportunities, but then if you look at my old YouTube stuff versus some of the stuff that I create now, fucking wild. Like, but, like literally, <laughs> I, I watch it and I'm like, what the hell are you doing, boy? <laughs> Oh my gosh. I mean, it's the, it's the double-edged sword of having social media and being able to so easily look back on your past self and thinking, what, what the hell was going on there? Yeah. yeah. It was, it's, it's the changes in the hairstyles, changes, like, oh my God. When I look back, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so baby faced. <laughs> <laughs> a better time. I would take my baby faced self to be fair. I'm getting older very quick. I think I'm a few years older than you. Although I still get ID'd. I got ID'd for my Tesco delivery the other day. The Tesco driver came to my flat and said, is your mum or dad home? And I was like, this is my, this is my Tesco order. Oh, <laughs> to be fair, so... I got ID'd. I, I, I got ID'd. I keep getting ID'd for energy drinks at the moment. And you're like, <laughs> guys, come on. And the worst <laughs> thing is they do the horrible thing of looking at your date of birth and going, oh, sorry. <laughs> my bad, my bad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's weird. Um, well, I, you've knocked me off track now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, the the talking thing, like that's mad. I I I didn't know you did TEDx. That 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 must have been quite an experience to do. It was, yeah, it was so scary. It's like I don't actively publicize it anymore because I just I'm not happy. I'm really happy with the content, and I would do the content again. I just think I could have done it so much better. So it is frustrating and it's one of those things again where i hope i get the opportunity to do it in the future but you can never bank on it so i've just i should just be grateful that i got to experience it at all um but yeah um, i'm like my confidence is definitely growing i was 
petrified at TEDx. Whereas now yeah. I would probably still be petrified, but I'd feel a bit more like I knew what I was doing, I would hope. Yeah. I Whenever I've done speaking speaking opportunities, my biggest two things. One is I talk too fast, which is wild, because Me although too. I probably talk too fast now, I'm a mo- lot more controlled doing stuff like this rather than doing talking to a crowd. But then the other thing that's horrible, and this is a purely me thing, of being ginger (laughs) and being nervous are two things that don't go well together because you tend to go red very quickly. And it shows very quickly. So, like, you're trying to, in your head, try to make sure that you look professional, but you know you are the colour of a tomato, like, chatting 100 mile an hour, and you're going... What am I doing with my life? And the worst thing is, I relate this back to when I used to do my swimming. Obviously, swimming involves no top. I used to come up in like, not even, I, I'd just be blotchy, but I'd literally look like I was just hot and bothered. And coaches would know straight away that I, I was nervous or worried about something. And it's the same when I do speaking events. My face just goes bright red. I love doing them. Like when I do them, I'm like, oh, this is really cool. And I'd love to do more of them. But I just, I need... I need to get into a rhythm with doing them so then I perfect the skill. But yeah, yeah every time I'm still petrified. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like you, you could feel completely in control, but if your face feels like it's betraying you, that's going to knock your confidence. Even if you yeah. feel totally prepared, if you think that something's going haywire, that's oh no. It's you're as self conscious as it is when people are looking at you. So that I, you have my empathy with that. I mean, I'm a bit of a bully <laughs> myself, but I'm not redheaded, so I imagine it's a whole different kettle of fish for you. It's, it's oh. quite weird. And then the other thing, like, I remember I did a talk just before Christmas and the only reason they asked me to do the talk was I was attending anyway for the, the like group discussion round table and the main speaker pulled out. So like 20 oh. minutes, be- 20 minutes before the talk, the event, they've come up to me and gone, G- can you step in? And I'm like, uh, yeah, but I don't know what you want to talk about. Like, they were going to talk about their life and everything else. Like, my context isn't the same. So I kind of had to make something up on the fly. Terrifying, absolutely terrifying. That's so impressive, though. I mean, that's incredible to be chucked in like that and to make it work. Do you know what made me do it is I had this little voice in the back of my head going, I don't want to do this because I am a plan freak. I like having a game plan. I felt very out of my comfort zone. But then I also sat there and was like, you need to just see whether you only regret the, the risks and the chances you didn't take was what was going through my head. So I was like, three, two, one, go. Because that's something. So a weird thing I have in my head is if I'm ever overthinking something or or need to like just get it done, that's a little voice that I, in my head that I say, you've got three seconds to be scared, then you just need to do it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And sometimes with stuff like speaking, it's when you're not as planned as not as confined to a thing. Like if you're, that's one of the mistakes that I made earlier on. If I was trying to memorize like a whole, like, I don't know, half an hour talk and I was constantly trying to like picture the words in my head, the delivery of it is a lot less natural than when you're just talking like this and you're just having a natter, but you're just doing that with an audience. It's also like the whole thing of, I I really struggle. Like I, I did performing arts in school, always have done well in that space. But give me a script and I go to pieces. <laughs> I cannot follow a script for love nor money. However, give me the gist of what you want me to say. Yeah, fine. I'll, 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 I'm off and running. But yeah, scripts, not a chance. So Gina knows if I ever do stuff, if she tries to script me, like my social content. Jesus Christ. If there's like a set line that I need to say in like a promo, that 20, that five second clip, that's taken like 50 takes because I've got. <laughs> Ah, oh, shit. Ah, oh, we're going to do this again and again and again. And all the other ones. What am I saying again? <laughs> <laughs> I was literally just going to ask you about the influencer thing because nobody realizes that one of the hardest bits is getting that brief, figuring out what you need to say, and then remembering <laughs> to say it while making it sound completely natural and authentic to you, which it is because. Yeah. We're the same. We pick them carefully, don't we? But, yeah. oh, my gosh. And you think, oh, I've nailed it. And then you look at it and you think, oh, I've missed that one word out. And that one word is really key. And if I send yeah. this off, they'll send it back and I'll have to do it again. And it's, oh, it's a whole thing, isn't it? 
Do you want to know the worst thing? The worst thing with a lot of my social stuff, particularly with the promo stuff, is if I think a take is like, it's okay, I won't look at it. So my rule is Gina makes the decision because if I look at it, I will, I will sit and overthink it. And I'm like, look, you need to just make the decision. If it's good, if you believe it's good enough, I trust your judgment. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, that's it. And Gina knows what she's doing. If there was anyone's judgment I was going to trust with someone, something like that, it would be Gina. <laughs> true. That is very true. But yeah, it's honestly the worst thing with social content. Like everyone sees the like nice, pretty, polished product. The amount of time, like honestly, the amount of like takes you get on your phone of you just going, no, try again. <laughs> 100 percent oh my gosh although it, it definitely gets easier with practice doesn't it it gets easier with practice and i feel like as well when you don't get a, if you've got a brief that isn't too constraining that yeah. becomes a lot easier because then like if they, they it's like i say if someone says like you need to get this sentence into the content that messes me whereas if someone says this is the messaging we want we don't care how it's delivered that's a game changer. That that makes my life so much easier. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like you've got your three main points. If they say these are the three things we want you to talk about, and it's like, yeah, sure, I can do that. Whereas if you're having to like read out these very scripted things, oh, it's the worst. It's horrible. Um, just quickly wanted to touch on like obviously we spoke about you speaking, but the consultancy. What what the obviously everyone's consultancy is slightly different about what they get involved with. So what is your consultancy? Like what are the often the projects and the, the the things that you're involved in? Yeah, so for me, it's less of um, it's not really something that I do like as a freelancer where I go to lots of different clients and do the same thing. It's more that I work with a smaller number of organisations, but um, I'm a communication consultant, which is one of those mm -hmm. terms where you think, well, what does that even really mean? And it's one of those things where it can mean so yeah. many different things, and yeah. it usually depends on the size of the organization so there are some bigger organizations where the comms consultancy focuses on things like figuring out how to tell the story of this organization taking all of these like key charitable objectives and figuring out how to make them appeal to people and how to build their online community and stuff like that and then there are other ones where I'm working for smaller organizations and they won't mind me saying this, um, but I work for an organization called Astrid and it's very much everyone is in the same boat. It's a small team and you're doing like a million <laughs> different jobs within your one job role. Yeah. So in that sense, as a comms consultant, I'm doing like the comms, the marketing, the social media, the PR when, it, when it's called mm -hmm. for. It's just, it's a lot. But for me, the main thing is focusing on the how you take the objectives of that organization and how you tell that story and how you make it appeal to people and how you basically just tell, just communicate. What do you want to communicate to everyone else and how are we going to do that in a way that's engaging? And yeah, I really enjoy it actually. It's mad. Like the one thing that like you said about them wearing many different hats and having to get involved in different things. The hardest thing I find with that is like, so you've got, obviously when we're talking about our own brands that are ours, the directions you can go in, like you, there's no CEO that you got to talk to. You are the CEO, but in that context, I think that's really hard because you've got so many, so many cooks in the kitchen, and so many people to please. It's like making sure that everyone's happy and the messaging is correct. I can imagine as a communications consultant in, in any context, whether you are wearing many hats or not, that's really tricky. For sure. And I do like, I have a really good relationship with the CEO of the charity I work for. And I do always say to him, you have to tell me if I'm getting a bit too precious over it because I really gatekeep the language and like the comms. And if something goes out or someone wants something to go out and I'm not happy with it, I'm like, right, stop, hang on. We need to do something about this. <laughs> but it's tricky when you're, again, when you're a freelancer and you're a disabled person with your own lived experiences, there's also constraints on how you might choose to do something in one way, but you, you have to comply with the organization that comes above your own preferences. So with lots of organizations that I work for, I always think if it was me personally putting this out, I would word it this way, but this is how they want it. So I'm going to have to word it this way. And that's sometimes a bit of conflict that you have to navigate as well. Yeah, and that's very hard as well when you get into the conversation of your true self and and believing on what you believe in. Like one thing well, I was actually going to bring up was the challenges when it comes to language and disability because people have so many different preferences. Now, I personally don't I don't give a shit what 
terminology you use as long as it's just not downright offensive but other people are a bit more particular about the phrasing and the terminology used and that in communication for businesses then becomes very tricky because that I think is where the issue comes from of the disabled community being quite scary to the outside world of like they're too worried about offending people and that's actually why we started the not quite pod was because we wanted to have these conversations but have it in a way of if someone had questions they can ask the questions I'm not I'm not going to attack them because I'm a believer of I'd rather you say the wrong thing and then I teach you why that's the wrong thing and you understand the context behind it rather than me jumping down your throat and going, that's the wrong terminology, how dare you? So how is that journey? Obviously, you've said, obviously, that you have to meet the requirement of the client and the, the client comes first. But in terms of how you've seen the community evolve and the terminology that's used, how do you navigate that both as Pippa running Pippa's businesses and then running it with clients? So the way I generally go about it is I have this one-stop inclusive language guide that I wrote a long time ago and I'm constantly reviewing. And that is all what I see and what I've learned from the community is best practice for inclusive language at this, ta- at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's not, I was going to say it's a chunky document. It's actually not. I've, ma- I've made it as like concise as possible. So it's usually the case that when I'm having that conversation with somebody, I send that over and I say, this is what I see as best practice in the community at this time. This is what I would personally recommend, but I'm happy to take on any of your own recommendations. And if it's not a disability specific charity, they usually panic and think, oh no, that's too much. Although I say all the time, inclusive language isn't difficult when you understand the why behind the different phrases that are preferred. Um, So that's one way that I go about it, but Chronic illness adds a bit of an interesting slant here as well. Like, again, they won't mind me saying this. I, would, I wouldn't I would say it if I thought they did. But like just this morning, I've been in a comms meeting about whether we're going to use the words. We're going to use the phrase long term condition, long term health condition, long term illness, energy limiting condition, which because they're all slightly different. And it's yeah. like all the nuance that comes with that. It's I find it really interesting because I love the language and the comm side and stuff. But it can lead to friction and difficult conversations sometimes. But I think I think it's like I have a similar feeling to you where as long as I know that somebody is trying to learn um, and they're generally paying attention to what the disabled person's preference is as opposed to parroting on with whatever their own beliefs are, um, okay. I'm generally of the mindset that like, okay, that's not what I would have chosen, but this is what I would have. And honestly, I'm not an assertive person by nature. So whenever I do manage to do that, I always feel really proud of myself. Like one yeah. example, quite, I was going to say quite recently, it was last year, but um, I went on the radio and they, I read, you know, sometimes you get to read the intro that they're going to use and stuff before you do it. Um, they put Pippa has chronic fatigue and I went to the producer and I said, that's not the name of my condition. Chronic fatigue is a symptom. It's not the condition because my condition is so much more than chronic fatigue syndrome. So we actually ended up having a conversation about that on air and why chronic fatigue isn't the name for the condition. It's a symptom of lots of different chronic illnesses. And yeah, yeah, I find it really interesting, but I know that not everybody would. (laughs) No, I do. I really enjoy the conversation around uh, language you is what I my biggest thing and as I said is is that whole thing of like I just don't I want to bring the outside community into the conversation where everyone feels safe the best best times when people learn is when no one feels judged by what they say if you're in a group and you're like oh you need to be careful what I'm saying you're not being you which then means we're not actually getting a true representation of what your belief system is what your understanding is Whereas, whereas I would much rather you go, oh, you're a handicapped person. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah, handicapped, although fine. Like that's a, I mean, one thing I find on a bit of a weird tangent, one thing I find really interesting is that word's used so much more in the States than, yes. than here. 
Yes, it's such a weird example, but I don't know if you or Gina watch Dance Moms. I don't even know who Abby Lee Miller is. No, no, Gina might, I don't. <laughs> oh, I mean, she's a bit of a problematic, well, she's a very problematic person to start with, but she became a wheelchair user in the last few years. And I always see like people like her using the word handicapped. And I always, I always internally bristle a bit, but it's like you said, that's yeah. what's normal and comfortable and acceptable to them. So it definitely challenges you a bit with what you're comfortable with and how your preferences might differ to someone yeah. else's. Which I think we could always, all of us could always do with being more mindful of, I think, especially in the online world. I think as well, I think it's just that for me, the ideal scenario is if someone's got a particular way, they the terminology they want to use, if someone uses the wrong one, correct them. And then from then on out, they can try and use it. Obviously the whole thing of people are going to slip up and say the wrong thing every now and again there's also allowing that now if someone's consistently doing it then it is a problem but if someone's occasionally used the wrong terminology they're still trying and if you see them correct themselves i don't think it warrants then being pulled up on it because you can see that they've realized it themselves it's Oh, language, I mean, you know it better than I do. Language, I think for me, it'd be so frustrating just because I'd be sitting there like, one thing's right for one person, one thing's wrong for another person. And yeah, it's, I mean, it comes back to my same thing. And, and I think I say it on every episode now. Just call it disabled toilet, disabled toilet. Why do we need to overcomplicate it? <laughs> Oh my gosh. And it's like, there's, and I think it's just remembering as well, there is never going to be a solution that universally pleases every disabled person, no matter what yeah. it is, what language it is, what adjustment it is. There is nothing that is universally going to be accessible or inclusive for everybody. So you just have to do the best you can and just remain mindful and empathetic where you can with the full knowledge that there is no blanket solution for any of this. 100%. Actually, one other question I wanted to ask before I hit you with the last question because we briefly touched on it and you're now traveling through the social, uh, using the social model a bit more. You said, what is your view on the social and medical model? Because my view is there's a place for both, particularly in the work that I do in the sort of recruitment space and making businesses more inclusive. I think there's definitely a space for base level of knowledge coming from the med medical model. Basically, when I look at it, I, in terms of getting businesses to be more inclusive and knowing what to look for, the medical model works because it allows them to have sort of parameters to work within so they know what areas to be looking. And by that, I mean, like, if you're dealing with someone like me, who's a wheelchair user, you're dealing with physical disability, therefore you're going to be looking in these areas for supporting them. Whereas if you're dealing with someone who's neurodiverse, maybe got ASD, you're going to be looking in these areas. So then it gives them a ballpark to look into and, and then you can do the whole drilling down and going, actually, this is how Joey's ASD presents. So this is what support he needs. Well, then the social model does have an element of if someone's able to access the office and everyone's able to access the office, great, all good, no problems there. But yeah, I think that's where I see it. So there's like links to both. So what's, what's, what, where have you come to since you're doing some sort of exploring of this area? Oh, it's so complicated and I could talk about this forever. So I'm going to try and keep it uh, brief, but it's, it's been such a journey going from having that no understanding of disability and living with a very disabling and stigmatized medical condition to experiencing some improvement and beginning to engage with the world again and discovering those social barriers for the first time. And I do wholeheartedly support the social model. And I think the social model is the most progressive thing that's going to facilitate the most change and lead to an inclusive world. So I definitely throw all my support behind it. But in the past and still to this day, actually, it can be difficult figuring out where chronic illness fits within that social model, because yeah. while there are access barriers, it's the experience of being so profoundly unwell that like you can't not say that your health is a barrier, like even in the most yeah. accessible world, even with all of the policy adjustments in place, even if you can join in from with everything from home, if you can't leave the house with chronic illnesses like mine, there is always just that most debilitating unwellness that in the past didn't really seem like it fitted into that model. But in the last couple of years, there's been some amazing work by an organization called Chronic Illness Inclusion, and they kind of tackled this head on and they kind of thought about how they could produce a framework where chronic illness could better fit into that social model. And that's where the term energy limiting conditions came from. Um, and it kind of posited that as a whole like 
specific impairment group within disability. So there's physical disabilities, there's learning disabilities, there's neurodivergence, and there's energy limiting conditions. Mm. So it's kind of like a subtype in that respect. And it's given us like the language and the framework and the fact that you can reframe fatigue as energy impairment. And it's definitely not perfect. And it's definitely not a concrete solution. But that I think has been one of the most significant moves to bring in chronic illness a bit more out of the medical model and a bit more into the social model while still holding space for the fact that it is this really medically disabling thing and that health is still such a significant factor. So it's definitely a process, but I feel a lot more comfortable with what's happening now. I feel much less conflict than I did in the past. I think, yeah, like you say, when we were doing the research into um one of the projects I'm working on, it the chronic illness space and the the sort of variability of that then does make it very difficult from a educational point of view, from educating others on it, it becomes really tricky because it as I say it presents so different in any individual. And there's not really there's parameters you can sort of give someone, but <laughs> those parameters are going to be very wide and it's, it then becomes very difficult. So I think particularly in the context of um, chronic illness and, and those sort of more hidden disabilities, that's where, yeah, that's where I think a lot more work needs to be done. And it's, it's really nice to hear that actually that is slowly coming into fruition as well. I'm really excited to see what the movement looks like over the next few years. I'm very curious. I've got my own thoughts and my own predictions, but it feels like a really exciting time. So I'm really looking forward to see how it progresses. Watch this space. Yes. (laughs) Um, Right. I'm going to hit you with the last question, which I ask every guest, which is what's one piece of politically correctness that you really strongly agree with or disagree with? It doesn't have to be disability related. I think I'm going to change my answer because I feel like we've done some pretty heavy stuff there and I might just go for like a really lighthearted one. I'm looking at my bookshelf behind me. Based on the examples you gave me earlier, I think I can get away with this. But there is a lot of snobbery in the bookish community about how you organise your bookshelf. And I don't know if you can see behind me, (laughs) but I organise my bookshelf in a very set way and I organise by colour and I make no apologies for that. But there's a lot of snobbery online that says only you can only be a serious writer if you arrange your books by series or alphabetically and people who arrange them by colour are just silly influencer types, which I am a silly influencer type, but also look at it. But it also looks more aesthetic. So like I think so. It also plays into like giving you a nice backdrop. So I, 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 I see no problem. And the thing is, my series are all still together. I don't know if you can see, but I still do put my series together. So I've got the best of both worlds. And also, I spend a lot of time feeling not very well laid down on my sofa. And just being able to look up at these these books behind me, it brings me joy. And if something brings you joy, then we shouldn't be having people shitting all over it. You said I I can swear cut. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah, I mean, I, I have sworn a good 10 times in this episode, so you're all good. <laughs> came out and I had a minute where I thought, oh, hang on. <laughs> no, you're good. I, uh, but no, it's true, like, how fussy some, like, uh, these little communities that we're part of can get. I have really, like, trivial things. It's like, oh, I, oh, you're not a true gamer unless you game on PC. What? Also, why, are we, had, why, why is everything a competition? I wish I had so few worries in life that I could be concerned with how other people were doing these really like minuscule things of unimportance. Like imagine having the time and space to care about stuff like that. Oh, mate, as you, as you said earlier, like the whole thing of like constantly spinning plates, I would just appreciate being able to turn the volume down in my head. <laughs> oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> or the other thing, like, the best way to describe my head, and, and it only happened sort of a year ago when I realised this is the best way to describe it, because I was having trouble sleeping and I was trying to explain it to Gina. And did you ever play the Nintendo Wii? Yes. Do you remember the tiny little characters that, like, if you bumped into anything, they'd go, like, wave their arms in the air and they'd start running out? <laughs> yeah. So... That is my brain. So what my brain does is if there's a problem that needs solving, so say for example, like we've got a specific problem with the with the podcast or whatever it might be. So my brain will then have this little tiny version of Charlie, very similar to that character that you'd see on the Wii, and basically make it run 
from different ideas and options to solving this problem to see what the best option is. But it would frantically run between each option by doing the same thing of like, that doesn't quite work because of this. That doesn't quite, until it finds the perfect solution and then it shuts up. But other than that, it would just keep, keep going. Keep going. Forevermore. That is such a good way of describing it. <laughs> it I, paints honestly, a picture. Honestly, like, it's the only way I can describe it because people go like, why do you struggle sleep? Because I'm like, because what I lay down and my brain just goes, oh, you can start thinking now. And you're like, no, that's not what I'm here for. <laughs> it's my time to shine. <laughs> Oh, God. Anyway, we went, we were on a very big tangent, but no, I don't, I don't understand when people get very pernickety about the way we do things and all. And also, like, that whole thing of, like, if you don't do this, then you're not part of the community. It's like... Yeah. To come, yeah. To come back to a disability, uh, disability space buzzword, that's not very inclusive, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. We can't be dealing with that. We don't want all of this gatekeeping. There are much bigger and more important problems in life than how someone arranges their books or what they're gaming on. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And you heard it here first, folks. Yeah, that's my hot take. All the things going on in the world, and that's, that's the hill I've chosen to die on. <laughs> no worries. I mean, I've, I've heard, I have heard people do it for less. So don't worry. Um, <laughs> Right, last things, last things last. That's not quite right. Uh, <laughs> lastly, where can people find you if they want to follow you on your journey? Where can they find your new book? And where can they follow you and what you're up to? My blog is lifeofpipper.co.uk. I'm Life of Pippa on most social media platforms, but you'll find me on Instagram more than any of the others. And you can pre-order my book now from anywhere you like to get your books. And it's out on the 18th of April, 2024. So I'll be curled up, either really excited or completely terrified on that day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'd be amazing. I will definitely be checking it out. So Thanks. I will leave the links to all of Pippa's stuff below, including her new book. So go check it out and yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Not Quite Podcast. Please make sure you follow us on TikTok and Instagram to get regular updates about the podcast. These bad dads, they get hurt.